All right. Thank you very much for the introduction, and also the thanks to the organizers for the you know, inviting me to speak at this uh, wonderful conference. I'm thanking all in person and also online for staying at the very end of this uh, scientific meeting. Today, I want to talk about the uh, polygenic risk score modeling, specifically thinking about how do we pick the training examples to be more inclusive in characterizing polygenic scores. Um, we like to consider the human genetics, which is the, basically the mapping problem between the genetic variation in your human genome and the phenotypic variation we observe in the population. Um, this is a now a good time to study human genetics because large number of individuals with a rich genotic information is readily available in many, many different cohorts. It is not uncommon to see more than 100,000 individuals with the genotype data in UK Biobank, Millions Veterans Program, um, Biobank Japan, FinGen, and other uh, emerging biobanks across the globe. Taking advantage of those large-scale cohorts, like uh, we geneticists perform genome-wide association studies, and uh, you know this is a commonly used technique to study the genetic association of each variant independently and try to characterize the loci associated with the disease. As you can see in this uh, Manhattan plot, which is a way to visualize the results from GWAS analysis, there are a lot of genetic variants and loci passing the Bonferroni corrected significant threshold which is like a basically on the bottom of this particular plot. So with this recognition that many complex traits are polygenic, people have been started to build a method to aggregate the genetic effects across many genetic variants into a single score per individual, which is the, which we call as polygenic score or polygenic risk score. Um, in this polygenic risk score framework, we basically characterize a set of genetic variants that is relevant for trait prediction and try to estimate their effect size in terms of multivariate regression framework. So basically you need to find which variants are relevant and also estimate the effect size from very high dimensional data consisting of more than 1 million variants sometimes. So obviously there are like some challenges when performing this kind of polygenic score analysis. Namely, there are like linkage DC equilibrium structure exists they're like meaning that there are like several correlation across many, many different SNPs. So it is like a necessary to select non-redundant set of SNPs so that you avoid double counting of the same genetic loci for a polygenic risk for modeling. Another challenge is that the large scale data set, you know, are consisting of more than one million variants, consisting of hundreds of thousands of individuals uh, made us like a very, you know, constrained in terms of computational challenges. You know, it is not easy to load all those genetic data in memory. So you need to be, you know, innovative in terms of designing the statistical model that characterize this kind of polygenic score across individuals. Typically, Bayesian approach, Bayesian multiple regression approach will be used to construct polygenic risk for modeling. In principle, uh, like uh, there are like three steps in this like modeling paradigm. First step is population stratification meaning that to select the you know, a set of individual who is like a, a homogeneous in terms of ancestry background so that you minimize the confounding due to the systematic allelic, allelic frequency difference across population groups. After you identify the set of individual you care about in terms of uh, this analysis, you perform genome-wide association analysis to get the univariate association summary statistics containing the effect size estimate as well as their uncertainties. The last step is basically feeding the Bayesian regression model that takes the results from the GWAS association analysis as well as the population matched LD reference as the input. So by doing this, you are basically avoiding the computational challenges in loading all the data in memory, but rather try to use those like LD reference combined with the GWAS summary statistics to fit the polygenic score modeling. Um, this kind of modeling is sometimes useful for some traits. At the population level, we see a distribution of the polygenic score. Some people have high score, other people have low score. And for some traits, the difference in those like a score distribution between case individuals and controls individuals are statistically significant, meaning that there is a possibility to perform the genetic-based patient stratification and try to like identify subset of individuals who has the high genetic liability and who may benefit from you know, more frequent attention from the healthcare system. Um, especially in the context of like a cardiovascular disease, um, the, the polygenic prediction 
has a higher discriminatory ability of the patient compared to the rest of the population, even compared to the conventional risk factors. And uh, you know, in some cases, combining the polygenic scores as well as the conventional risk factor further increase the ability to stratify high-risk individuals in the population. In other cases, we can use those like a polygenic score predicted trait value as a kind of instrument variable for you know um, various kind of epidemiological analysis. In this particular example here, like uh, the authors correlate the predicted value of the biomarkers, so polygenic score of the biomarkers, with the you know lifespan. I uh, try to understand what's going to be the mechanisms or biomarkers influencing on their human lifespan. So in those scenarios, like having the polygenic score would be useful. But there is a limitation in the current polygenic risk from modeling, which is the generalizability across population groups, especially across ancestry groups. Uh, this perspective paper published a couple of years ago really highlights the limitation in the current, limit, current approach in the polygenic risk for modeling. Specifically, if you train polygenic score models in individuals of European ancestry, the predictive performance of the model does not extend to non-European uh, individuals. You can see the performance, relative performance drops as you move from like a European ancestry to non-European individuals, such as the American, uh, South Asian, East Asian, and African populations. So this is in part due to the you know, underrepresentation of the non-European individuals in the current genotype cohort. So obviously, like uh, there has been a lot of efforts to actively recruit non-European individuals or traditionally underrepresented minorities in the you know, genotype cohort. In parallel, there are like um, several methods developed to you know, characterize polygenic risk score, taking advantage of large scale European population as well as uh, non-European cohorts. So one way to think about it is try to think about you know, feeding a polygenic score for a European cohort as well as the non-European cohort independently and try to consider a linear combination of those. The idea here is to try to take the best of both because the European cohort is large in sample size, meaning that we have the most power in identifying set of genetic variants relevant to the disease. And uh, you know, for the population-specific component, you are able to capture by feeding a separate score from non-European population and try to combine them together to uh, hopefully to improve the predictive performance across non-European population. So this idea has been explored already, and there are like several papers published this year. And this looks successful. Obviously, there are, like, there are like more challenges in terms of sample collection, but there are some methods to address you know, uh, the gap between the predictive performance by combining the polygenic predictor across ancestry groups. So far, this is looking good, but uh, there is a group of individuals who is excluded from this kind of polygenic score analysis, which is admixed individuals. So just looking at the UK Biobank data as the example, we have a good number of individuals who is not captured in the current existing approach. So UK Biobank is a population-based cohort recruited in the UK. So the majority of the people in this particular cohort is of European ancestry. And uh, you know there are some other non-European non individuals represented in this data set, such as the sorry, such as the South Asian individuals, African individuals, 6,000, 7,000 each. But there are like 40,000 individuals who does not, you know, uh, captured in the current approach. Uh, many of them are admixed individuals. 40,000 is not a small number because, you know, the total sample size is like 400,000 in the unrelated individuals. So we have missing 10% of the individuals who is not typically used in the current polygenic score modeling paradigm. So why this is difficult um, to include other mixed individuals in polygenic score modeling? So going back to the Bayesian paradigm of fitting a polygenic score, you start with a population stratification. Sometimes you exclude a lot of other mixed individuals, running a genome wide association study, and then try to fit the Bayesian regression model. That takes GWAS association summary statistics, as well as the LD reference panel as the input. So we don't know how to represent Linkage discriminant ref reference panel for the admixed individuals. So there is a methodological limitation in how do we model, how should we model the polygenic score for those admixed individuals. To that end, we considered alternative paradigm, 
which is to fit the polygenic score directly on the individual level data of the genotypes and phenotypes without going through the GWAS association. We specifically use the Bayesian algorithm, um, but screening iterative lasso algorithm implemented in the SNPnet package that we uh, developed together with the collaboration with the statistics department a couple years ago. So this approach uh, mitigates the computational burden by uh, designing an iterative procedure to fit the you know, penalized regression model. I don't have a time to go through the methodological details, but uh, you know, this method is capable of identifying the exact solution of the penalized regression, last store regression, by doing the iterative procedure for polygenic risk for modeling. Previously, we showed that this method has the comparable predictive performance with other like modern Bayesian uh, regression model. And uh, because of the sparsity in this model, the resulting spread polygenic score is a lot sparser than what we get from the polygenic score model from Bayesian approach. So we tested this approach to, you know, including admixed individuals in the uh, polygenic score modeling. So we focus on four uh, different kind of training set individuals in this particular scenario. The baseline is looking at the uh, white related individuals only. Uh, the second set is looking at the multiple populations consisting of like a European ancestry, South Asian, Africa individuals. The third one is like, uh, you know, the white British and uh, non-British white, South Asian, African, as well as the admix individuals. Those three groups are kept to be the same total sample size so that we are not like uh, favoring one particular approach based on the sample size and power. Lastly, we included the maximum number of individuals who we have access to in the UK Biobank just to see to, to what extent we can improve the predictive performance by performing inclusive polygenic score modeling. We use the same test set individuals to evaluate the performance for a fair comparison. Specifically, we use the R squared for a quantitative test and AUROC for a binary test. So now, looking at the predictive performance for uh, some of the quantitative traits in uh, across individuals in the African ancestry, we see uh, dramatic improvements for the predictive performance for some of the traits. For example, like a neutral field count uh, prediction performance is basically zero in the baseline model trained only on the European individuals, like R square of 0.001 or so. But if you do include the you know diverse uh, individuals in the training, including the admix individual, we see the improvements in the predictive performance, like R square of 0.057. So this is like a you know, 50 fold increase for the predictive performance for the, uh, this particular blood trait in African ancestry. Similarly, we see improvements for leukocyte, which is white blood cell count, and, uh, you know, for, and also for other traits as well. Just to get the summary number in, in terms of like a, to, what, to what extent we get the improvements in predictive performance, we show the uh, relative improvements of the predictive performance on the y-axis and the plotted against the predictive performance in the baseline model trained on the white British individuals. If you see point above y equals at zero line, that means we see the improvements in the predictive performance because we are plotting the difference between the two models on the y-axis. We fit a linear regression model and uh, get the slope of the regression model as a summary number of the improvement across the trace. So in this particular case, we saw like on average of 30% improvements for quantitative traits in African individuals. Across uh, different populations, across different quantitative traits and binary traits, we see the improvements in the predictive performance, especially in the African populations. And, uh, you know, nice thing about this kind of benchmarking here is that uh, as you include more individuals in the inclusive training, you see a drop in the predictive performance for European individuals if you fix the same number of individuals in the training set. But you do see improvements in the predictive performance even for the European population if you include a maximum number of individuals in the training. To summarize, I presented the inclusive polygenic score training strategy using taking advantage of the polygenic score method that can take individual level data as the input. On average, we saw 30% increased improvement in the portability across African populations. And uh, I think like uh, because of the availability of the admixed individual, this approach is gonna be helpful to improve the uh, transferability of the polygenic score across populations. Um, thank you, and happy to take any questions. Maybe we can take one quick question, but we really need to wrap it up. Quick question. 
Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, are you treating all admixed individuals like the same in your training data? Is yeah, what I mean by same, like... Like uh, one group of like all admixed individuals. Yes, so we don't provide any label for those like individual. We do provide the, you know, genotype PC as a covariate. Um, but the, the non-covariate component of the model don't look at, uh, you know, who is labeled as admixed versus European. Got so it, we just provide it. everybody. Yeah, I'm worried if you're. Um, I, I, I'm. I'm. I'm wondering if you're worried about the uh, like statistical artifacts that you could get with, for the same reason that we don't do GWAS in a like heterogeneous cohort of uh, genetically uh, based on heterogeneous genetic individuals. Um, and so, would you consider uh, training maybe on groups of individuals with similar patterns of admixture if you were to like incorporate not only one level is like looking at local admixture, but not even that fine grain, maybe just like genome-wide proportions. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think like uh, the, which approach is better is still unclear, but uh, the, this model does not mean that like there is no ancestry-specific genetic component. Rather, mm -hmm. this is like a try to capture the ancestry shared genetic component. And, uh, you know, from the best, based on the result we have, like uh, just starting with the ancestry shared component may not be that bad just to capture the genetic basis. Mm -hmm. If you have more number of individuals in the different kinds of admixed individual, we can start to go to discover specific genetic basis uh, for that particular subset of individuals. But I think we need to get more data. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you.